So today we're going to be looking at that. Um, we're in the fourth week of the Apostles' Creed, and it's kind of an exciting one because we're in the story of Jesus and what he was all about. That's the majority of the creed is just about simply Jesus, and we're going to get to that. And the text we're using today is from the Gospel of John, the beginning of that Gospel, John 1, but we're going to start at verse 9 through 18, okay? The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. So here we are in week four, but I'm going to summarize a little of where we've been just to get everyone up to snuff. So we are studying the Apostles' Creed, and we started out in week one with, I believe. I believe, not I know. And that's a huge difference. It's not about knowledge in the head, but trust in the heart, and where you can rest your whole lives on this creed. It is the foundation of everything, the foundation of our lives. I believe. And that's what we're excited about, the fact that we can rely on this God, and this God makes me who I am. He is my identity. My relationship with him gives me everything. And two weeks ago, we spoke about then, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And we said God is infinitely powerful and beyond our comprehension, and yet We see again and again in the scriptures how intensely personal and fatherly he is. And keeping those two things together is so important to have clarity, balance, and belonging. And we understand whose we are then. And last week, we got into, and in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. And just that simple phrase and taking each word through it and just how much power there is in each of those names and words of God and the fact that Jesus is that foundation on which we can build our whole lives, the cornerstone, and everything else is building on a sinkhole. And we know what that's like in Florida. It's going to cave in at some point in time, but Jesus is rock sure for us. And now we're going to be filling out that last phrase. Now, the Apostles' Creed as I said, is over 1,500 years old. It has been confessed by the ancient church to the modern church by 2 billion people throughout this world today. In one form or another, it becomes the foundation, the seminal work that we have, not because the creed itself is something, but all the scriptures, the story of God, the gospel is behind it. And what the church has always done from its inception to the present is to do two things when it confesses the Apostles' Creed. And I said, we, first of all, denounce, deny, reject the narratives of our culture, whatever that culture is, at every time. You can study it through history. There were different things to reject. For instance, in the early church, it was the idea of the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, as if there was peace through Rome. It didn't come from that. And to reject that Caesar is Lord. No, Jesus is Lord. They rejected the the teachings of that time and period, and we do that today as well. And then they also pledge allegiance to this one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who has weaved himself throughout our entire lives, who created, who redeems, who makes us holy, calls us his very own, and keeps working in our lives. So they do those two things. So when we have stood, or when we confess, or when we teach on this creed, we're doing the same things today. We are actually denying or rejecting the narratives of our culture, and one of them is individualism. And individualism in one form or another is basically saying, I'm going to fix it, 
I'm going to do it. I've got all the goods. I get to define my life my way, and what I want is what I want, and that's what I should get. Right? And we reject that. We pledge our allegiance to the God of the gospel instead. We also reject another form instead of just individualism, but nationalism. That is where we reject that the values of any nation become our values as if that's going to solve everything, that a nation is going to solve the problems of the human heart. It just doesn't happen, okay? Now, don't start emailing me right away, okay? I understand it can be touchy subject when we get to our nation or world, but the Christian church has its allegiance, not necessarily, I love this nation, And even through this election cycle, which I think we all kind of endured and praise God, it's over, you know, we know that we are not the end all and be all, that the nation is not going to solve the biggest problems, that they are not in politics that's going to do it, but it is something that God has to do. Whether it's collectively or individually, human beings are not going to solve our own problems. So we reject nationalism and we reject individualism and we say here's where the answer really is. In this living God, this loving God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so phrase by phrase, we're going through this foundation that we build, okay? So today we get into the part of the story and he was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, okay? Now, we look at that and we can kind of say, okay, that sounds like Christmas, great, it's a nice little historical phrase, and we can kind of move on, and let's just get on to the next phrase. But boy, there's some real power in this. There is some real good news in the fact that Jesus Christ was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. Now, I guess you could say we could get into talking about the Holy Spirit and the work of the Spirit of God from the beginning at creation all the way through redemption. And now, all the way to the culmination that we're looking at in the future, but we're going to do that on January 8th when we get to that part of the creed that says, I believe in the Holy Spirit. And I guess you could say we could look at the Virgin Mary and kind of focus today on how, you know, the virgin birth, is it conceivable? Hmm, pun intended. Okay. You got that, didn't you? Okay, okay. But... um, that's, but what you find in the scriptures is Mary is a wonderful model of faith where she says, be it done to me according to your word. But you never find independent stories about Mary that just talk about Mary and focus upon Mary, but they always focus on her relationship to her son, Jesus Christ, wherever you find. So you don't find that focus. It's always on Jesus Christ being the center. And so what we're really ca- talking about today, when we hear that phrase, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary is the teaching or doctrine of the incarnation. Incarnation. Do you know what that word means? It means in the flesh. Okay? Just in the flesh. All right. Now, this is how John started out his gospel. And we don't have that in the phrase that we had, but he put this. He wrote, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The word behind word (laughs) in Greek is logos. Have you ever heard of logic? So when John wrote this gospel, he was writing to a people who understood there's logic behind the universe. There's logic. There's reason. It makes sense. There's rules and laws and things hold together. And they looked around and they knew there was some structure behind it all, something weaving it all together. And they called it the logos, the logic, the reason behind it. I think it's very similar, believe it or not, You know, George Lucas did not come up with this idea, but believe it or not, the Greeks and the Romans believed in the force that kind of united all things. Now, not that you can kind of manipulate it and figure it, but the fact that there was something that did that. Now, what was so radical about what John wrote in his gospel when he said the logos, in the beginning was the logos And the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. What shocked them, he wasn't saying it was a force, an impersonal thing, but a person. That shocked them enough right there. 
And then when our text says it this way, that the true light was coming into the world and the true light was going to show the truth, they go, oh, yes, finally, we're going to understand the logos in this world and somebody's going to reveal what that logic is behind everything. But then he stunned everyone, blew them out of the water when he wrote, and the logos became flesh. Are you kidding me? How? Why? They would never understand this. It doesn't make any sense to them. That doesn't make any sense to them. And they basically said, you know, God is so pure and so holy and so other and so beyond, beyond. Why in the world this infinite God would ever want to become finite like we are? We want to get away from this. We deal with all sorts of problems. Things fall apart. Why would God want to be involved in this? And how could God, the infinite God, fit into anything finite in this world, no matter how big it is? It's not big enough for God. And beyond that, this place is messy and broken and dangerous and yucky and mucky and, you know, we don't even like it here sometimes. How in the world would a God want to ever come into this world in such a way that he becomes one, what? One with us. That just doesn't make any sense. We human beings... And it's true today. Look around. We see this messy, mucky, dangerous world, and we try to avoid it. We build walls, and we buy locks, and we keep people at arm's length. We find people that are unseemly, and we try to ship them off to the next city. Somebody else deal with it. Not in my backyard, we say again and again. We have barbed wire fences and security systems and security guards and military buildups. Everything that we do, most of what we do in this world is trying to avoid and push away the things that are messy or mucky or dangerous. Escape is our middle name. Our first name is fear, and our last name is protection and security. And those are the things people push for. And how in the world and why in the world would a God who's above it all and beyond it all ever want to get involved in this messy, mucky, dangerous, dirty world? That's where the incarnation just is incomprehensible and miraculously great news. Because it's because of love. Love. At the center of God's being, incarnation becomes the action of God. And vulnerability, yes, vulnerability becomes the result. Now, so that word incarnation just basically means in the flesh. And this is not just a, an occasional thought in the New Testament. It is that rock bed solid. This is why Jesus is so important. And so we see this in Colossians 1.19. It says, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. So he's fully God and right here in the flesh. In Colossians 2.9, in him the full fullness of deity dwells bodily. You get both together. Or this in 1 John 4, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And finally, our text today, and the Word, the Logos, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus is one person with two full natures, fully human and fully divine. Why is this so good? Well, like I said, we've got locks, walls, guns, barbed wire fences, security systems. We do everything to protect ourselves because we know there is something wrong with this world. Okay? It's flawed. It's a mess. Everybody knows that. Okay? Now, sometimes people will say it's because, well, it's because of ignorance in this world. That's why we have so many problems. And so let's just educate everybody and figure it out. And guess what? You can still get somebody who's brilliant, like Ted Kaczynski, Kaczynski, excuse me, 
Ted Kaczynski, who is the Unabomber, brilliant mathematician. Education didn't solve anything there. Or you can end up saying, hey, we just need more rules and laws and legislation because that way everybody will behave. And you can get police states out of that. And guess what? It just goes underground. It goes behind the scenes. You don't change anybody's actual hearts, just maybe their behavior once in a while. But boy, let's tell you, there's passive aggressive resistance all over the place in those types of societies. Others say, hey, economics is really the problem. It's why people don't have enough stuff. And so if we just make more stuff and have more stuff in people's lives, everybody will be satisfied. But I have found, and you probably have seen, some very wealthy people who are still greedy and looking for more, right? Didn't seem to solve anything. Education can't alleviate it. Legislation can't fix it. Science and technology don't resolve it. Every attempt that human beings have come up with, from individualism to nationalism and every ism in between, is just another way of avoiding the real issue. What's really wrong with us, according to the scriptures, is not our economics or our politics or our physical bodies and what we look like. It's not going to be solved by anything be except for Jesus, because the real problem is called sin. Okay? And I know that's not a popular word, but that's why the the, the, and, and some people have some very misconceptions about that word, okay? Um, it's a disorder that is not just this or that, or I did that or did that. It is my attitude, my rebellion, my I want to do it my way and have my life the way I want it. Don't tell me what to do attitude, okay? It's just there. So there are two ways that kind of sin plays out in our world, and it's kind of gets, that's why people get confused about it all. They often think sin is just doing something wrong. Like I said, oops, I lied. Oops, I shoplifted. Oops, it's over. But sin is much deeper. It is my animosity, my hatred, my rebellion, whether it is passive or active, overt or covert, hidden or revealed against God. And it's in everyone. So sin can be open and outright rebellion. We can see it with people becoming hedonistic, you know, just living the way they want, individual self-expression. I just, this is what I want. It's saying, God, you designed this world this way, but I'm going to live it this way. This is the way I want to live. Nobody can tell me what to do. Jesus talked about this, really, in a parable that everybody seems to know, or many people know, called the prodigal son. It's the younger son who looked at his father and said, I want to live the way I want to live. Drop dead, God, uh, drop dead dad. I want the money now. I'm leaving. That is rebellion, outward, you know, hedonism, whatever way you want to say it, it is irreligion, according to um, Timothy Keller, just living what I want to live when I want to live it. But there's an equal and opposite um, sin as well, and that is the older brother's sin in that parable. Okay? It's more subtle, but it's there. It's passive-aggressive to its core. Okay? It's religion. Religion, religion the way the world works it, moralism, trying to live my life according to the rules, is another way of passively, aggressively, basically saying, God, I really don't need, I need your advice, I need your ideas, but I'm going to take care of it myself and look at how good I am. Look at what I have been doing. I am not like those people over there. I keep the rules. I pay my taxes. I'm a good citizen. I'm this. I'm that. That is also a rebellion against God because you're basically saying, I don't really need you. I just need your advice. It's the older brother who worked like a slave out in the field day after day who, when the father comes and says, your younger brother has shown up, says, look you, <laughs> you owe me. And it's trying to get God to owe me a good life, a nice life. It's amazing, really, how you can be sinful by playing the church game. 
You can go to Sunday school and sing songs and raise your hands at the right time and cry the tears and say the phrases and say things like, well, the Lord really, I think the Lord is leading me, which is another way of saying, I want to. <laughs> you can pick up the Christian language and kind of get all that lingo going and that moralism going, and in the end, you're basically saying, there's no real relationship here, I just want what I want when I want it. And both ways, whether it's hedonism or moralism, whether it is irreligion or religion, just become ways that I want to stay in control, I want to lead my life, I want to tell everybody else what to do, and nobody gets to tell me what to do. God owes me two equal and opposite errors. And that's why the incarnation is such good news. Jesus said, or John said it this way in John 1, 10 and 11. The world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. So Jesus enters into this world of religion and irreligion, of moralism and hedonism, of self, individual self-expressionism and nationalism and everything else going on. And he gets involved in this messy, mucky world. Why do I say all these isms are things that we reject when we say the creed? It's because any ism, when it takes over that level of thing, is just a, a salvation scheme that falsely promises, hey, if you follow this, if you've got this, if you do this, then you get the goods. It's just a false, false promise. Nations are good. Pleasure is good. Morals are good. Rules are good. All those things can be good, but they are not God, and they cannot take the place of God. You can see that this attitude of me being the center is all over the place in our society and world. Just go into a Books a Million or a Barnes and Nobles. What's the largest section of books? Self-help. I'm going to fix it. We're going to fix it. This is the problem. This is how I fix it. This is what I do. This is what me. Self-help. Where's the God help section, <laughs> right? Where's the Jesus save section? Where's the Holy Spirit empower section, right? And even in the religious section, sometimes you find all sorts of self-help-ish books. And it's not about self-help. It's really about, in the end, the incarnation. So why is this so important? Because if Jesus is fully God and fully human, it changes everything. If he's just a good guy, a good human being, a good moral teacher, then we're basically left on our own again. We've got a good example of somebody who lived a nice life and did all this stuff, and we might inspire a few people, but we're still living in this broken, messy, mucky world. Nothing's really changed. One more person just died for that. But if we had a God who appeared in some form but not being truly human, he'd basically be saying, hey, I love you, but from a distance, not so much. I love you, but stay over there. I'm going to stay over here. It's safer that way. He'd be at a divine arm's length distance from our chaos and mess in this world, and we'd be able to recite his name at the beginning of Congress and before all sorts of sports events and have a philosopher's God who doesn't really get involved in this world, and we'd still be stuck with our mess. But because Jesus has appeared to be both or is both, both, that is, fully human, fully divine, fully God in the flesh, we have good news. Now, the way John said it in uh, John, um, John's gospel here, he said that the law came through Moses. It's another way of saying, hey, anybody who's even a pro prophet and knows the reality and the, <laughs> knows the truth, all you're going to get is law. The best you're going to get is advice. It's never going to be enough, even when it's God's truth. But grace and truth have come through Jesus Christ because he is God in the flesh, and he brings us the truth and grace and bears our lives upon him. 
Do you have a God who understands you completely? Not because he knows everything omnisciently, but because he has experienced it personally and vulnerably. Just think, if you would travel right now to Syria or Iraq, tell me, what precautions would you make? Kevlar jacket, for sure, helmet, Bradley tank. And even then, I wouldn't even want to go. Would you? And here we have the God of the universe who comes behind the war scene and our rebellion in the midst of it all, and he places his son as a vulnerable baby in a manger for a maternity ward. What is God doing? Why would he experience that? And we see Jesus weep. We see him rejoice. We see him hungry. We see him fall asleep. We see him experience the exasperations of being human. He gets close to friends who then run away from him, deny him, betray him. He sweats drops of blood in the garden and agonizes. He pours himself out. He serves. He gives. He dies. And this is God at the same time. The incarnation says God loves you. God understands you. God will suffer through anything for you and experience it in your place. He doesn't stand off at some distant, doesn't um, just touch it a little. He takes it all in and becomes everything that's wrong with this world on the cross. He becomes sin who knew no sin and dies and puts it to death there. He becomes the cure. So by this portion of the creed, again, I think we get clarity, we get balance, we get belonging. Clarity. At the root of the world's problems is not just this little issue or that issue or I can fix it this way or fix it that way. At the root of the problem is right here in my heart. It's in my life. It's my rebellion. And the only cure for that is a full life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I can become religious or moralistic. I can become hedonistic or try to do it myself. But the problem really is right here, still there, no matter what I try to do. I'm not going to be the cure. I'm not going to fix it myself. Self-help is an oxymoron according to Christian life for salvation. Okay? And the more that you understand that Jesus Christ is the cure, actually the more joy you have. And this is why I mean that. Can you imagine if the more you would think that, well, the more that you think that you save you in any little form, the more you know you could mess it up, just like everything else. But the more you realize it's not that you save you, but God has saved you in Jesus Christ, the more sure you can be about that. There's no question about whose you are or what God has done or how you've been received into the kingdom. You can live with assurance in this chaotic and messy, mucky world because God has done everything for you in Jesus Christ, becoming one with you, taking your place, dying for you, rising again for you, uniting him to you and you to him through the waters of baptism. You are his. So you can say, as Paul says with such assurance in Philippians 1, 6, and I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion on the day of Jesus Christ. That's because you've got a God who's come into the flesh. That is clarity and what joy that is. What peace you have. Then it also gives us balance. Because Christians are really not world-denying escapists who say, hey, we're going to live for a few points. I'm just visiting right now. I'm trying to get out of here, trying to avoid this, avoid that, get out of that. Jesus got into the middle of everything. Some of his best friends were some of the worst people in society. Didn't bother him in that sense. He was there for them. He said, I came to save sinners, not the, the sick, not the healthy. 
And so we as Christians don't escape from the world, don't try to purify ourselves by separating ourselves physically from others. We actually see ourselves being able to be in the world but not become of the world, just like Jesus Christ did. Okay? We can have balance in our lives. We can have our feet firmly planted on the ground. And I think that's why it brings up as well belonging. Because Jesus came down to earth, we're down to earth people. You don't have to storm the heavens to try to get to God. You don't have to try to prove anything to God. But we can be down to earth and be real about the mess in our own lives, our own brokenness, our own fallibilities. And we can accept anyone into this family who comes here because Jesus has accepted them and forgiven them and loves them. We can be real about that. It's not just for others, but it's also for yourself. Because right now, some of you might be feeling like I have felt many times in my life, oh, God, I've blown it again. I can't believe it. Why do I have such a struggle with trusting you? Why why can't I? Why do I still keep stumbling? Why do I keep falling? Why... The more you're in the Christian life, the more sinful you, you know, sometimes you just feel, oh, it's, it just doesn't go away. It's deeper than I thought. It's just, it's, ir- it's beyond what I can, how, and we know that we've got someone who understands us, even when we don't understand ourselves. This is the way the book of Hebrews says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. In every respect. He understands. He gets it. He really gets it. He knows you. He knows what it's like. He knows how messy this world is. Hospitals are for people with sickness. Schools are for people who don't know everything. And churches are for sinners. Get it? Clarity, balance, belonging. So, where are you today with all this? Is Jesus just some historical figure? Was he just a good guy to you? You're not quite sure what to do with him? Or do you realize this is God in the flesh who's come for you? Or is Jesus some kind of deity, kind of almost walking a foot above the ground, never, you know, just kind of in a beatific vision all the time, speaking a few words here and there, kind of revealing, the, but not experiencing and agonizing and going through it? Realize Jesus is right here for you. And what he wants for you today is in our text where he said, where John writes in this gospel, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. That is, not born by your decisions, not born by your ability to do it, not by born biologically, but born again by God. That God comes and makes you new because he enters into your life through the words of the gospel and the Holy Spirit renews you and you become a new being, righteous, holy, and precious in his sight. That's what he wants. The incarnation is not just to show up, but to rescue you, to have you, to be one with you, to come face to face to you, to be bone of bone and flesh of flesh with you, to know you personally. And I think it's time for us to pray for that now. Father, we thank you. You've loved this world so much. You sent your son that he became one with us, that he became vulnerable, that he experienced the pains and agonies of this world beyond what we can understand, that he was tempted in all things. He struggled with all the issues we've ever faced. And he did it victoriously without sin. We don't understand how. We don't know why other than your love. But thank you, thank you, Jesus, for being one with us, being the God for us, not just appearing, but really being with us. 
and hallowing this earth by becoming present among us and being present with us today so that we can pray to you always, to know with clarity we are saved, to know the balance of living in this world but not being of this world, and to know, Lord, we belong to you. And you belong to us, and we get to celebrate that for eternity. So for those, Lord, today who struggled with this understanding of Jesus, we pray, Holy Spirit, you work in them that they can believe and receive the right to be children of God, not born out of our own decisions or will, power, but by you. All this we pray in your precious name, dear Jesus. Amen.